Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Sonia, and I'm thrilled to be your host for this Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event today. Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants aims to inspire the next generation by bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation into classrooms through virtual live events, just like this one. Today, we are so lucky to be joined by James Herrera, who is gonna be talking to us about adventures into remote rainforests and lemur conservation in Madagascar. I don't know about all of you, but I am so excited. And so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to James. Thank you, Sonia. It's really great to meet you and to have all the classrooms tuning in. I'm really excited to talk to you today um, because this will be the first time that I'm uh, talking about lemurs. Uh, so, you know, specifically about lemurs for the exploring. And it's a topic that I really, uh, care a lot about and um, it's obviously the focus of the Duke Lemur Center. So yeah, let me get started and just let me know, can you see my uh, slides all right? I hope so. <laughs> yes, we're good to go with your slides, James. Great. So yeah, today I'll talk about conserving the lemurs of the Sava region, which is in the Northeast of Madagascar where the Duke Lemur Center has our conservation projects. And uh, it's really a, an appropriate time to be talking about lemurs because tomorrow, the 30th, is World Lemur Day. And so I hope you're all gonna get excited and dress up like lemurs in your lemur onesies and have a big party. In Madagascar, they'll be celebrating in the Sava region. And even here at the DLC, we'll be having a virtual gala event. So check us out online to sign up. And then of course, Exploring by the City of Your Pants, we'll be having an all day lemur festival. So check us out tomorrow too. Now, it's also really appropriate because day after tomorrow is Halloween, right? So the 31st, and uh, everybody's going to dress up like ghosts and goblins. Well, the word lemurs actually means ghosts, and I'm going to talk to you about how lemurs are a lot like ghosts or spirits in the forest. But first, where are we in the world? Well, Madagascar is off the southeastern coast of Africa, and it's the fourth largest island in the world. And so, you know, being there next to Africa, most of the animals that occur there actually probably dispersed from Africa, some from Asia and other places, but a lot from Africa. And the Duke Lemur Center has our conservation projects up in the Northeast. It's called the Sava region. It's an acronym standing for the four cities in the area. Um, and these are the ghosts of the forest, the lemurs. So the lemur really comes from a Roman word for ghosts or spirits. And these guys are very similar to that. Uh, you see this one kind of looks like Casper the friendly ghost and they really are friendly um, in terms of their behavior with each other uh, often. But they are really amazing animals and they're also kind of like ghosts because they're so elusive. They're hard to find, hard to see. And I think the early explorers probably called them lemurs because of the haunting sounds they make it and you just sounded like there were spirits calling in the forest. So hopefully you'll be able to hear this. That's the call of the Indri, and they are kind of wailing and, and calling as a duet that the males and females sing together to warn other groups, hey, this is our territory, stay away. And they live in habitats like this. These are the rainforests of the Northeast Madagascar. They are lush tropical jungles all over these uh, really steep mountains. You can see some of them are um, you know, really rounded mountains, but others are like these steep cliffs. And there's just jungle clinging to all of these mountains and there's lemurs clinging to those trees. So deep in these forests, uh, explorers have to go uh, trekking sometimes for days to find lemurs. So today I'm gonna talk to you about the lemurs of Madagascar, obviously. And I'm especially gonna focus on how a Malagasy team of scientists recently led a survey or a study of endangered species in a very vulnerable area that I'll tell you about. And how, uh, you know, in collaboration with the local organizations, the Malagasy scientists are trying to create a conservation action plan to better conserve the lemurs into the future. So lemurs are the famous primates of Madagascar. There's about 100 or so different species, and they range in size from the smallest lemurs, the 30 gram mouse lemurs that fit in the palm of your hand. They scurry around at night uh, foraging for insects. And then all the way to the biggest lemurs, the injury that you just saw, around 10 kilos or 22 pounds, like the size of a medium-sized dog. 
uh, and then a range in between. And these species have all different kinds of lifestyles. Like I said, some are out at night uh, eating insects or flowers. Others are eating leaves. And then some are active more during the day and you see them eating a lot more fruits, they eat leaves. Some of them are specialized on eating bamboo that is so much cyanide in it, a type of poison, it could actually kill a person and yet the lemurs eat it with no problem every day. So they're really, really fascinating and I especially wanna to talk to you today about the frugivorous lemurs, the lemurs that eat fruit. So they are really important because when they eat the fruits of, of trees, they tend to, a lot of them swallow the fruits whole. And when they uh, digest those fruits and the seeds, the seeds actually pass through their digestive tract into their poop pretty much intact. And then they grow better when they've actually been eaten by a lemur than if they haven't been. So the lemurs are like the farmers of the forest. They're helping to plant the trees for the next generation. So I wanna take a pause really quickly here and ask you guys, you know, what is your favorite lemur? Do you guys, have you been following the Duke Lemur Center and other um, posts and videos about lemurs? And can you tell me a little bit about what you know? Classes. I don't know if the teachers want to indicate in the chat if one of your students has something to say about lemurs, what they already know about lemurs. And I can come visit you guys. I can see in the YouTube chat. Oh, we have Miss Sears class said that my students favored the small mouse lemur. Small mouse lemur, yeah, they're really, really great. They're um, fascinating for a number of reasons. In fact, they have about 20 different species of mouse lemurs. And in all different like pockets of different habitats, you tend to have a different species. And that kind of makes sense because they're so small, you would imagine they can't really disperse too far to go like across a river to the other side. And, and so there's a lot of theory that that's what, what creates so many different species of mouse lemurs, that they're separated by these river barriers, but they're all super cute. Some of them are really endangered too. We also had um, Ms. Gross class said that you don't know a lot about lemurs, but they are very excited to learn more today. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to tell you about them and please do follow up if you're interested on the, the Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants site. There's lots of great lemur, uh, lemur videos there. All right. I see about the eye eye too. I love the eye eye as well. They're another elusive one. My team and I spent three years doing nocturnal surveys trying to find them, and we only saw them twice. All right, great. Well, I'm happy to tell you a little bit more, and I'm going to, oh, King Julian, the ringtail lemur, of course, they're, they're the most famous, I'd say, and um, also, you know, really uh, famous in zoos here in America, so, and, uh, you know, in, the, in Canada as well, so you can probably see them there, too. Awesome, I can bring your slides back up, James. Great. So now that I know a little bit more about uh, you guys and your, your background and interests, let me tell you about um, the specific lemurs and, and you know some of the kind of sadder part about lemurs. So unfortunately, can you, uh, hopefully my slides are already up, but um, the lemurs of Madagascar are, are actually one of the most endangered species, groups of mammals. You know, there's a hundred species and out of those hundred, about 90% are considered threatened with extinction. That means that, you know, for about 22 of them, they're critically endangered. And that means that within the next hundred years, we think they could go extinct if we don't do something now to save them. And, you know, there's a lot of different factors that are putting them at risk. And, you know, maybe you guys have heard about some, um, but one of the number one, you know, there are common themes across the world. So things like poaching um, and the loss of habitat, but for lemurs, it really seems like the loss of habitat is one of the biggest factors. So here we're gonna zoom into the Sava region in red in you know, Northeast Madagascar. And this map is showing in green, the forest cover in 1950. And at that time, Madagascar was still a French colony so they were basically like the government was controlled by France with, you know, uh, French policies. And there was a lot of push for increasing agriculture, especially crops that were being exported to Europe, like coffee and sugarcane and cacao, which was used for chocolate. 
And um, there was a lot of deforestation at that time because there was also a lot of logging to um, build railroads and to fuel the need for trees and timber and charcoal abroad, as well as in Madagascar. So by 1970, Madagascar had already gotten their independence, but we could see that there was been a lot of deforestation. And then in 1970s until the late 1980s, there was a lot of political um, difficulties that led to economic crashes. And whenever we see economic crashes, we tend to see that you know, people have to turn to whatever means they have at their disposal. And if there are farmers who are living at the forest edge, you know, they're, they're turning to farming and often they're having to clear more land to do so. And so by 1990, and especially what we see more recently in 2017, is that the forest has really contracted, it's been fragmented, and now most of what remains is inside of uh, different kinds of protected areas that I'll tell you about. So the main cause of this deforestation is actually for local agriculture. It's not really for the industrial agriculture like what we see in Borneo with the uh, oil palm and things like that. This is mostly uh, what we call smallholder farmers, farmers who only own two to five acres of land, and they'll cut the vegetation on their land and let it dry, and then they burn the vegetation. And by burning it, they release a lot of the ash and char that has minerals that plants can use to grow. And so they will get a very quick uh, return and, and a, a good crop in that first year, but often they have to then switch to other pieces of land to, to continue to have good productivity. Hunting is also a big problem in Madagascar, as we see in a lot of places around the world. And I'm sorry for the, you know, kind of gory pictures, but, um, you know, it's, it's something that's a real growing problem. Also the pet trade. So as cute as the lemurs are, they are not pets, they're wild animals and they should remain wild. And here you can see where people have kind of captured a wild lemur and they have it tied up with a rope as a leash. And this is, uh, you know, these are real big risks for, for wild animals. So here we're zooming in again to the Sava region and I wanna point out, you know, these patches of green, these are the forests and they're really fragmented. And I said that some of them are now protected. So here we have the Marojeji National Park and then to the west, they have the Anzanahari Bay Sud a protected area or special reserve. Anz Marojeji, by the way, means many ghosts or many spirits. It also means a lot of rain or fog and many rocks. And then Anzanahari Bay Sud, if I understand correctly, it's like the place of the big god. And then there is this protected area that connects them, which is a corridor forest. And that means that it's like a bridge between these different parks that would otherwise be separated. If that corridor got deforested, it'd be like having two different islands separated where the lemurs can't get back and forth to, to spread. And so how are we gonna help to protect lemurs in general, all of us around the world, but especially the people in Madagascar? Well, it takes uh, a real collaborations and partnerships among a lot of different stakeholders, but especially local communities. And so the, the uh, World Wildlife Fund, WWF, this year, uh, and, well, they've been uh, managing that area, the Komatsa, the, the corridor between the parks for uh, many years. And they work very closely hand in hand with local communities to manage those uh, forests. And so every year they do lemur surveys to determine how the population is doing. And this year they teamed up with the university in the Sava region called Cursa, as well as the Duke Lemur Center to do surveys of the lemurs to see how they're doing. And these surveys were conducted by all Malagasy scientists. So these are some of the staff, teachers, and scientists from Cursa, like Anise here, Edgar, and Ardeal. Here are students who are graduates from Cursa, Romeo and, and Jean Jouot. This is a, a, um, a local Shifaka expert from near Marojeji. He's been studying Shifakas with some of the best Shifaka scientists like Eric Patel for uh, over a decade. He can uh, smell them from a mile away. So Nestor is his name and he joined the group to help find and track those lemurs. And of course, working closely with those local communities to, uh, because they're the, the real managers of the forest. So some of these sites are so remote. I mean, it would take days walking and here are the students with uh, local people helping to carry all their research gear. And it really was remote. But then when they got to these forests, I mean, they really saw some beautiful places with massive trees. And of course, they did find these elusive ghosts of the forest, the silky shafak, 
Unfortunately, they're so difficult to find that these are not uh, the pictures from the team. These are from uh, an earlier Duke Lemur Center um, trip with uh, our liaison, Laura Diara. But um, they're amazing animals. You can see that there's a lot of interesting color variation among them. Uh, sometimes they're all like silky white, like a real ghost. But then here you have these little brown caps. Um, this was an infant that was observed last year. We're unfortunately, we're not too sure about whether that infant made it. But the breeding in, in these shifakas is a real struggle, even in the wild. They only uh, reproduce the adults maybe only two to three, once every two or three years. And um, they don't reproduce until they're about three to five years old or maybe later. So it takes them a long time to, to reproduce. And they do a lot of nuzzling and cuddling and grooming that really makes it look like they do care about each other and love each other. I hate to anthropomorphize, but they're just always like um, grooming and playing. And so I wanna just share a little bit of footage from the BBC because the BBC actually went out there to, to these sites to see the lemurs and, and get uh, brief glimpses of them. They tend to live in very small groups, only two to 10 members at the most, and they have very big territories. They love to hang from their feet. They're really suspensory animals too. Here's what I mean by the nuzzling and grooming and um, they're picking insects and fleas off of each other, presumably, not necessarily fleas, but ticks and things like that. But um, they, they eat mostly leaves, but also hear the flowers of a vine. And because they're folivores, they have a very slow digestive system. There's a video all about this on the DLC page. You can learn about what's called faux livery, eating salad for a living. And so they take a lot of breaks, they hang out and rest, and then they play and they groom. And um, you can see that the whole family really does get involved and they wrestle and tug at each other's tails. And um, watching them move in the trees is just absolutely incredible. You can see how well adapted they are to the life in the trees. So this, these are some of the places where they're found. Uh, again, here are those parks connected by different protected areas. Oops, sorry. And the black dots here are previous studies by uh, Shifaka experts like Eric Patel, who have compiled all the known locations where the species has been observed. So you can see lots in Marojeji, a few down here in Anzanari Besu, just a few down here in Makira and outside of protected areas, which is important too. And then here they are in this corridor. And then the triangles represent where these Malagasy scientists actually found uh, the animals. In orange, they actually saw the animal at three out of the nine sites. And then in the green, they saw traces of them. And these are really experts. They were able to even find the tiny little pellets of feces to, de to determine that yes, this species is there. Uh, there are other species as well. So this is a white fronted brown lemur um, and the males have a white face and the females don't have that big white um, kind of uh, Afro or like a Albert Einstein type hair. Then there's also a common brown lemur, which uh, is closely related to the white fronted browns, but they don't get that, that white, white Einstein hair. And uh, it's actually really uh, unique that they were found together with the white fronted browns in this habitat. They haven't, they're really not known from this area. They're known from areas much further north. So this team of scientists has really helped to uh, broaden our understanding of the geographic range of these species. There's also the adorable bamboo eating lemurs doing what they do best, eating bamboo. Um, and they're another one that they live in these small family groups and they spend a lot of their time grooming and playing. There are elusive nocturnal animals that sleep in tree holes during the day. And if you're lucky, you might just find them. Here he is peeking out of his tree hole and this is a sportive lemur. Um, and they're really hard to find because like I said, they're hiding out in the tree holes. If you're lucky, you'll see them perched out there just keeping an eye on things. Uh, at night, you'll see the dwarf lemurs. And this is one of the species that's also studied by DLC scientists. You may have seen that there's a video by Dr. Marina Blanco about hibernation. This is the only species of primate that hibernates. Or there's others that do different kinds of, um, you know, like torpor and different kinds of hibernation. But the fat-tailed dwarf lemurs are the best known for this. Um, and then there's the adorable little mouse lemurs that uh, one of the classes told me they love. You know, forgive me for using the flash or the, the flashlights on the animal for this, but you know, when you're doing the nocturnal surveys, you've got to use a, a light to try to see them. So the, the team also observed a lot of threats to the lemurs. So these included hunting. Uh, they actually directly observed hunting, clear cutting of the forest for agriculture, and selective logging. So let's go over a little bit of these you know, piece by piece. 
But what we really start to understand is that these are not, um, you know, just uh, evil doers who are out there because they hate lemurs. This is actually issues of human health. So the folks in Madagascar, you know, here are some statistics about um, in Madagascar, 26 million people in Madagascar. And it's a, a country about the size of Texas or France, to give you some perspective. Um, and 80% of that population is rural, living in the remote countryside. 70% of them are living below the poverty line, which is $2 per day uh, US. So we see also a lot of health problems from Allegazi people. So 48% of people are considered underweight um, and 36% of women are anemic. So these are issues of malnutrition, meaning they're not getting enough nutrients in their diet to have healthy lifestyles. Anemia is a lack of iron in the blood, which can really affect the general health and, and vigor of people. So, and it has a really important impacts on infant health as well. So hunting, as sad as it is, plays a large role in people's health for, for people who are living out on the countryside where they, they do hunt for food. But sadly, what we also see is that it's not just about hunting lemurs for food. It's also about providing a, a new market in the city. And so that we've learned, you know, these are snares that you see out in the forest. And even some people are hunting with guns. And a lot of these are, are not for families to eat. They're for the people to take very long distances to the cities to sell to restaurants and hotels where um, urban people are interested in having like exotic meat. And so it's not about improving health in that case. So we're looking for a lot of alternatives. And that's where the Duke Lemur Center comes in and where we've been working very closely with local partners to find alternatives. And one of the alternatives that's been spearheaded by the DLC for a long time is fish farming. So these are actually ponds that were hand dug by the farmers and with sophisticated you know, piping systems to be able to drain them seasonally and harvest fish. And they just had a, a har fish harvest where 13 kilos of fish uh, were produced in just a few months. So this is one sustainable alternative to the, the, fit, the farming, I mean, excuse me, for the hunting. We also try to promote, uh, you know, kind of a, a sustainable agriculture known as agroforestry, where we're recognizing the importance of the natural environment for providing a lot of the minerals, nutrients, um, and other things that our crops need in farming. So for example, trees can pull minerals out of the soil and put them in their leaves. And when those leaves fall, we can use them for compost and put those minerals where we want them with our, our crops. A lot of the important crops that people wanna grow like coffee and cacao actually need shade and they grow better in shade. So the trees provide that shade. They also can help to attract beneficial biodiversity, the, the kind of biodiversity that helps the farmers like the bees and the butterflies that pollinate their crops. Also the um, birds of prey and snakes that help to eat the pests like rats and insects. So there, it's really important to have this kind of agro ecosystem. And that's one of the projects DLC is trying to promote in a lot of different villages. So here is one of them where we're producing trees with a nursery at a school. And here demonstrating how to tell which of these uh, coffee trees is ready to be planted but it's a mix of a lot of different species. So also like the important fruit trees, here we got some avocados and also native trees. These are some of the native trees in the background. And having training with farmers, teachers, uh, students, and even university professors and students helping to train and learn how to plant trees in their landscape. Here are some of the students helping the farmers serving as like consultants to plant the trees out in their landscapes. Uh, 600 trees have been planted by nine local participants, as well as planting lots in, in a demonstration forest. We're also, you know, partnering very closely with the farmers and the university to teach about uh, sustainable farming. Here, the farmers are making small home gardens using local compost that they can find all around them. Lily here is very excited to show off the compost that they've made. And so here, you know, the, the farmers working together with the students are helping to develop more sustainable farming practices. And it's also an opportunity for the local school kids to get involved, for the whole community to see that they have these resources all around them and they can just use them in a new way. And they're really, uh, it's, it's showing great returns. So here are some of the participants that have been, um, uh, you know, 
developing their own home gardens and their farms. This is a bean plant that started with just a, a handful of ankle tall seedlings and is now, you know, like three cubic meters of plants that are producing beans for the families. And here, uh, the families like Joseline and her daughter are showing off how proud they are of their harvest. Those beans actually also attract an insect. This is one, this one is a lantern bug, uh, also called a sakunji locally. And this bug, believe it or not, is edible and it is delicious. I personally love these bugs. They taste like bacon and eggs. I can snack on them like potato chips all day. And a colleague of, of mine, uh, Courtney Borgerson, who's been researching these bugs for a very long time, has shown that they have better nutrient qualities than beef or pork or, or chicken. So they're a sustainable source of that protein and iron people need. And we've also seen like really great, um, you know, transformations of small, like empty spaces of people's backyards. Here, Madame Mangel just had a little corner of her yard that she turned into a productive corn, tomato, and bean plantation. Um, you know, and it really doesn't take a lot of land. So talking about logging, logging is a whole nother issue. Like it, you know, the loggers, the people who are out there farming, uh, you know, they typically tend to be farmers who are, they need money to, to survive like everybody else. And so they are trying to cut trees to sell to these middlemen who typically live in cities and those middlemen sell to big bosses. And you see that the loggers are making very, very little money. It's actually been shown sometimes less than $5 a day where these big bosses are literally making millions. And so that's, you know, that's, that's the problem, not necessarily the logger, but there is this international market. This is what it looks like on the ground. You know, these are some of the trees that have been cut and uh, sawed up into planks and, and posts and things like that. And these loggers are working real hard. They, they go very far into the forest, risking their lives in a lot of uh, cases. They cut these planks up in the forest and have to lug them out on their back, all for these you know, $5 a day. And then they're being shipped out in huge containers to places all over the world, especially like China. And so that's really one of the biggest issues is these international markets. In fact, rosewood, which is one of the most highly sought after woods, is actually a bigger problem in terms of international illegal trade of species than ivory from the elephants or rhino horn. Uh, and, and that simply needs to stop. These international markets for precious wood, gems, people, all these international markets that are exploiting uh, the, the countries themselves. And also finding alternatives because people still do need wood to build their homes. And there are sustainable ways of managing forests. Uh, like for example, in this, in this scenario, you know, the smaller trees are cut first to open up the canopy which can allow the bigger trees to grow even bigger faster because they're not competing, but it also allows the understory to start to grow and regenerate. And this way, once you've cut the bigger trees, the understory has already started regenerating. And this is a cycle that takes 20, 40, 100 years, but it's, it's a sustainable alternative to what's going on now. So with that, I'm just gonna kind of wrap up with the overall goal that you know, we're striving to achieve lemur conservation as well as sustainable development. But they're not two different entities, they're really part of one big puzzle that we have to solve. And so we're trying to do that with the DLC and with our partners in Madagascar like Cursa, we're trying to do that through these activities like the research that I was telling you about, the, the students and staff going out and searching for these lemurs and helping to develop um, sustainable resource management at the local level because it's the local people's uh, right and responsibility to have these lands that they can use as well as conserve. And so we've got to develop the, the best practices. And that takes a lot of inputs. It takes partnerships with these local actors. It takes uh, trust and an understanding that takes decades to build. And it also takes the, the sponsorship to initiate because you know our goal is that these become sustainable projects in the long term but getting them started is an, a big investment. So we're looking for a lot more sponsorship to support those activities. And our next steps include uh, really meeting the, those community members, meeting with the, the people who are bordering those forests that I was telling you about in the Komatsa to co-create this action plan with the local stakeholders. You know, they have to have their voice at the table to, to really be the, the stewards in the long term and to come up with strategic activities that address the direct and indirect drivers of biodiversity loss and habitat loss. 
So with that, I just thank our sponsors that have made all this work possible, like uh, especially recently the General Mills um, and also the Helmsley Charitable Trust that has uh, been supporting this work for so long, the SOS grant from IUCN and more. And I'd also like to give a quick plug again, remember to tune in tomorrow for Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants to, um, to, to enjoy a lemur festival with, with an international community and to check out the Duke Lemur Center's gala event in the evening. All free. And Jeez, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, we have a bit of time to get some questions from our students. So I am going to check in with our first class, which is um, the St. George class. Hi, guys. Hi. hi say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I think someone's coming up for a question. How did the lemurs get to Madagascar? You're, you, you have a, a very interesting question that kept scientists very busy for a long time, and even today there's still debate about it. So thank you for giving me that question. Um, I would say, you know, most of the science points towards rafting, believe it or not. There was probably like 50 million years ago, there may have been a storm or like a cyclone or something that caused like typhoons maybe and big river floods that flooded and flushed a group of lemurs on floating vegetation from Africa to Madagascar. I know that sounds crazy, like a made up story, but that's the best we've got. And actually, there's a lot of evidence to support this. Actually, at that time, 50 million years ago, the currents were going from Madagascar toward, uh, excuse me, from Africa to Madagascar. So the currents would have been able to favor this dispersal. Um, and we, we do see this with like lizards today. Sometimes iguanas can get on these little mangrove islands and they, a storm will like rip up a whole patch of mangroves and take them from one island to the other and the, the lizards get transported. So maybe the same thing happened for lemurs, but we're really not sure. Awesome. All right, we are gonna head to Mrs. Lockett's class um, for a question. Hi there, we had a, a few students who have been um, concerned about the um, hunting of the lemurs in Madagascar. And they were wondering if you've noticed any difference with the intervention that you've been putting into place. Thank you for that. So, um, you know, these kinds of solutions are definitely long-term solutions. Um, and so it's hard to kind of measure that, that impact. Like, do we see a decrease in the hunting in relation to our activities? Um, and that's key to our evaluations, but I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Um, you know, we're, we're hopeful and we're trying to establish different kinds of research to answer that question, like doing interviews with people before and after the interventions um, to understand how those kinds of trends might change. Um, but, you know, at the moment, people tell us, you know, they report kind of anecdotally and in focus groups that when they have these more sustainable alternatives, they do prefer to use them. Um, but you know, that's, that's, it's very hard to tell. I can tell you that sadly, you know, because the, the, the WWF has been doing these lemur surveys at the same uh, sites over the last five years or so, and also recording the instances of things like hunting, I can tell you that the, the number of hunting, you know, signs that we've seen, like the number of snares has increased 2019 to 2020. So we haven't had any of these interventions in these areas yet, to go back to your question. And that's why we feel like, you know, these are maybe good alternatives. Um, but, you know, the COVID situation has caused an economic crisis in Madagascar, like in a lot of places around the world. And so that's led to a lot of these kind of illegal activities, too. So we're, we're battling a lot of these kind of factors at the same time. Thank you, James. In addition to our classes joining us in the live stream, we also have a bunch of viewers joining us through YouTube. So I have a question from David Leader Middle School in Mississauga. They asked, um, at the beginning, we said that lemurs have a special call. What is this call for? 
Great. Yes, lemurs have a lot of different vocalizations. In fact, I think one of the main studies on ringtail lemurs showed that they had like 15 different vocalizations or maybe more. I'm, I might be mis misrepresenting it, but they're very expressive. They do um, communicate a lot of information, not only with vocalizations, but also with scent, which is cool. They do a lot of scent marking, which other primates don't do as much of. Um, and the different calls have different uh, signals. So, for example, that injury call that I played in the beginning goes kind of like, ah, ah. that's like a territorial call, we think, that, you know, because different pairs that they have their territories will give those calls and you'll hear it answered by a group on the other mountain. And then another group will answer. And it's kind of a way for them to triangulate uh, where each other are. But then there's other calls that they use only in close contact and they're kind of like little grunts and groans, sneezes and um, the Shafaka, for example, uh, they get that name because in the West Coast, they have an alarm call that kind of sounds like she fuck, she fuck. So the Malagasy people called them she fuck and um, we call it Shafaka. But in the um, Eastern rainforest, their call actually sounds more like a sis, sis. And so the research has actually shown how you have almost different dialects in different lemurs. But then they give different calls for different kinds of predators. That's also cool. The zzz is often given kind of as a general call. And then if they see a ground predator like the fusa, they'll give this crazy bark alarm that I can't really imitate. But it's kind of like a wah, 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 wah. and it, it, it scares you. Maybe it scares a predator, too. I don't know. But um, yeah, they're very expressive. One of my favorites, if you'll entertain me in my lemur calls a little longer, is the ringtail lemurs. They give this kind of moan that sounds so sad. They kind of go, ah, ah. And you're like, oh, what's the matter? Anyway, sorry. Thank you, James. That was awesome. Um, we have a question from Mrs. Dare's class who is joining us virtually, and they asked, um, are there any seasonal changes that lemurs respond to other than preparing to hibernate? Yeah, thank you. So I'm glad you bring up the hibernation. There's a whole piece on that with DLC. That's a fascinating aspect of lemur ecology that's very unique. But one thing that actually my PhD advisor, Patricia Wright, her theory that kind of unified a lot of things about that are unique about lemurs is that all of them are responding to a very seasonal habitat in Madagascar, seasonal and unpredictable. So for example, there are a lot of lemurs that only eat leaves and it's a higher proportion than you see of like monkeys in Africa. The reason she hypothesizes is that the habitat is so seasonal that tree fruit production is very patchy, very aperiodic, meaning like it's unpredictable. So a lot of lemurs, that lemurs then really specialize on leaves. And when there's no fruit around, even the fruit eating lemurs will switch to leaves. So that's one, one change that we'll see seasonally. Breeding is extremely seasonal. And again, my advisor, Pat Wright, showed this, that almost all the lemurs are trying to wean their infants to get them off of the breast milk and onto hard food right at around the time of year, like January, February, when fruits are going to become available and other foods like young leaves become available. So then that means, okay, well, you've got things as small as a mouse lemur and things as big as an injury, all weaning at about the same time. And then all their, the rest of their life is kind of scaled to that. So they, you know, the time when they reproduce and the time when they're giving birth is all very tightly timed to the seasons. Awesome. We're going to check in with another one of our classes. This is the Fulton Vale grade three class. Hi, guys. Hey, everybody. I think you guys are still on mute. But I think you're, is that a lemur mask? I think that's a lemur mask. <laughs> Do you guys have a question? Sorry, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Okay, now ask. Do the lemurs cling onto their mom's backs? They do. Yeah, so when the baby's young, it clings onto the belly, but then as it gets bigger, 
it starts to explore more and more about mom's body and you'll see them kind of climbing and clamoring like mom is a jungle gym. And then as they start to get big enough, they'll ride on the back. And so at that time they're riding on the back like a, like a jockey on a horse half the time maybe. And then half the time they're kind of exploring the environment on their own. Um, they, they do seem to really like to play and climb around on their own and then mom will grab them and get going. But yeah, they'll ride on the back once they're a little bit bigger. Awesome, we're gonna take another question from our YouTube audience. And we have Miss Iannani's, or Mr. Iannani's grade six class asked, what type of lemur is the most endangered? And do lemurs typically stay in the protected area? Those are two uh, really hot topics, actually. So about a third of lemurs are considered endangered. And so it's hard to say which one is the most endangered. Um, am I still sharing my screen? Because I'm actually looking up the article for you. Um, no, I stopped sharing my screen, right? Okay. So it's it's difficult to say, but there are a few that are um, really endangered. So for example, the uh, there's a type of mouse lemur, the Madame Berth's mouse lemur. It's the smallest one, if I'm not mistaken. And they are only found in a small pocket of the Western dry forest. And that they only seem to like primary forest, if I remember correctly, which is unique for mouse lemurs because most mouse lemurs are very generalized. They can live in the um, then the secondary forests that have been cut by people in the past, they can even live like out in the bushy areas. But this specific mouse lemur only seems to live in um, primary forest. And if um, there's different kinds of protected areas, so some of them are like national parks, others are, you know, more privately managed. Um, but a lot of the lemurs do live outside of the protected areas. So there's just a really cool New York Times article about this, showing how the local people who take it in their heart to conserve the lemurs and really care about um, the, the habitat and the forest. They're, they own some pieces of forest and they are taking it on themselves to protect that forest and, and manage it. And so that's really exciting to see because when the people, the local people who own the land wanna take it and protect it, that's really inspiring. But so yeah, there's that one mouse lemur, the Madame Dorse mouse lemur. Then there was that one of those sportive lemurs that I showed a picture that he was hiding in the tree hole. There's one of those that's really only known from a tiny pocket of forest up in the north called Lepilemur septentrionalis. So say that five times fast. Um, and, and they're highly endangered. I think they're only known from one protected area and a few fragments around it. So there's there's a few that are really, really endangered, but there's, there's 22 that are critically endangered and 90% um, are endangered, you know, threatened generally. Wow. Okay, we have one more question from the St. George 2-3 class, and then unfortunately we're going to have to wrap up, but let's head over to them to um, ask their question. Hi, my name is Micah. How many of the goat lemurs are left in Madagascar? How many of them are left, especially those goat lemurs, like the white, the white shifaka I was showing? The scientist who knows best about these animals says that there's probably like 200 to 250 left in the wild. And that's, that's the best estimate we have. So it's not very many at all. Um, one of the things that we really want to do is to try to continue to do these uh, research adventures to like try to find all the places where they exist and really try to estimate that number for many different species because that's how we can really tell how endangered they are, right? If there's only 200 left, that's that's not very many to, to sustain the population in the long term. So 200, 250 for the ghost Shafaka lemur. Others, there may be less. Well, James, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. And I feel like we all definitely learned more about lemurs today and lemur conservation. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We got more questions in today than we could possibly answer in our time. So where can students go to learn more about um, what you do in lemur conservation and how they can be involved? Yeah, great. So I just wrote into the chat for everyone. Our website is lemur.duke.edu. My email is just my name, james.herrera at duke.edu. Feel free to shoot me an email. Check us out on Facebook, 
Twitter, I think Instagram too, <laughs> and um, uh, lots of different social media. And even right on the Exploring on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants page, uh, the Duke Lemur Center has been putting up uh, videos every Thursday, I think, for the last few months. So there's lots more that you can learn from different researchers here at Duke. And again, just feel free to let, send me an email. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to bring up our classes to wave. Bye and Bye, thank guys. you. Thanks, Bye, everybody. everybody. Thank you for joining me.